Yeah. Hit the recording here and let's get started. You ready to go? Ready to roll? Yeah. Are you letting people in or just is just taped? I just I just start webinar. Okay. Do it now and then people will just like roll it. Okay, cool. You want me to wait? Let's or? see. Um, no, I think um, I think we're good. Um, I think we're live right now. Um, okay. So welcome everybody. Yeah, I see the number goes up, so <laughs> we are live. Um, so welcome to another platform engineers meetup. Uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes for people to roll in. Yeah. Lee already went ahead and shared the screen. Um, uh, tell us where you're joining from, first of all. Um, this is our first um, specifically U.S. webinar. So hopefully a few, a few U.S. people rolling in. Uh, you can use the chat to let us know where you're joining from. Um, uh, and while we wait, um, as per usual, over the last you know, couple of sessions. Oh, there you go. Columbia, Missouri. Um, Oh, Alan Barr. Hey, Alan. Nice to see you here. Um, and um, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, as, as I was saying, like as per usual, um, I'm paddling um, Platform Con, which I think Lee will also uh, briefly cover uh, over the course of the chat of the talk. Um, so I'll pop in here in the chat for everyone to check out. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. It's the first ever Platform Engineering Conference. So very relevant to what we're speaking about today. Go check it out, sign up. It's free, it's virtual, it's awesome. Um, hey, Ravi from San Diego. Nice to, nice to see you here. So uh, usual housekeeping rules, guys um, and gals. Um, the session is recorded. We'll share it tomorrow uh, per email. So no need to go crazy on taking notes or anything. Um, Lee will do a about 20, 25 minutes sesh, um, and then we'll open it up to questions afterwards. Uh, but if you have any questions in the meantime, um, you know, while we go through slides, don't be shy, we wanna make this as conversational as possible. So just drop them in the chat or in the Q and A, and then, um, you know, we'll make sure that we, that we get to that either at the end or, or throughout. Um, yeah, I think we can almost get started. I mean, you know, Lee, I think, needs a little introduction, especially in our community. Um, he's a pioneer, built uh, platforms at really massive enterprise. He'll tell you more um, as much as he can tell you. Um, and um, I think um, I think we prepped, yeah, there we go. We prepped a couple of polls um, uh, just to get a feeling for kind of like where people stand with relation to, you know, Internal platforms, what are you guys working in a platform team? Um, and I guess like what you're familiar with, right? Because there's a bunch of IDP, um, you know, options that always pop up, especially in the platform engineering community. So we'll be curious to kind of like see what people here are familiar with and kind of like where you're coming from um, at this. So let me launch this. Um, and hopefully you can see it. So it's a, it's a three part poll that, is entitled because I forgot to put a title on it. Um, but um, there's a building your internal, are you building an internal platform? Are you working on a platform team? And what are you familiar with? Uh, backstage, you might take out bound out as box and chupa. So I see some answers rolling in. That's great. I um, guess uh, let me give it like a couple more seconds. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, um, you know, I mean, this community has been growing like crazy over the last six to 12 months. So, um, you know, really proud to see where we're getting to. And I'm really excited about today's session. Um, you know, we really wanna take a step back and, and kind of just have a conversation about it. So I have some stuff queued up for you, Lee. Um, hopefully folks will have some, some questions as well. Um, and then really let's just make this a chat. Um, but yeah, I think we can end the poll now. Um, can you see the results, Lee? I don't see the results, but just call oh. them out and let me know. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. We got basically a 50 50 split on whether people are building an internal platform. That's interesting. Also, an almost 50 50 split on whether people are working in a platform team. That makes sense. And then people are most familiar with Backstage and Humanitech. 
uh, with the, I guess, Sheep and Outbound uh, and Dallas Box, um, uh, sort of like uh, in, in third place. Okay, cool. That's it. Anning Paul, and uh, over to you, Lee. Um, I'll shut up for a little bit and then I'll, I'll pop up in the screen later again and we can have a bit of a chat. Yeah, whenever you want, just pause me. I'm, I'm in presentation mode, so just let me know when you want me to start. Perfect. But hey, I'll guys. Let you know. I think the big thing in here, guys, is like as we're rolling out and coming up to like platform con and the stuff that Luca's team been doing, it's like fantastic that that in this case that the, there, there's someone driving this force of this community around platform engineering. And let me tell you a little about my experience. And honestly, this is all open session, so anyone raises questions, we can stop. We just want to make sure we answer the questions appropriately. Then I can tell you my experience and how I did this and how I stumbled upon like doing platform engineering and those concepts. <clears throat> Let me, so just so you know, like professionally, you know, I worked at Apple, App Dynamics, IBM, and Apple, I, I maintain like the basic platform infrastructure tools, anything that was like DevOps, SecOps, but all of that under one team that we called it like the platform team. And that parlayed in the same thing that we did at App Dynamics. And at IBM right now, I'm heading them around like focus like Turbonomics and Instana around those tools. I think cloud optimization is like the big thing these days. Um, fortunately, I, I got lucky, sold a couple of companies that last seen in ServiceNow, then, you know, doing some advisory at some other startups too. Uh, personally, like, you know, from Bay Area, Chicago's home, but I see Ravi Joyan from like San Diego, love that place. That's where I was born out. So, I, you know, San Diego's like basically, honestly, my home, but it can never get out there. You know, normal situation, married, two kids and a dog. And just love golf and basketball. Um, anyone like it's kind of ironic. Like um, my friend used to um, follow the Cleveland Caval Cavaliers, and in that time, like we, I love LeBron James. So this was really early. So I used to tell my friend that he's going to be the best basketball player ever. So he got me this signed autographed jersey of LeBron James when he won like his high school championship. And I, I think anyone in America would know this, <laughs> or even in the world. So. He, he got this signed and like what happened, like I think in New York at like Sotheby's one time, he came up for like selling for like 350K, but I just don't know how to sell this stuff. So if anyone knows how to sell it, please let me know and put it in a chat. Then I'll split the commission with you or something. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> I just wanted to walk you guys through some of the thoughts what I was thinking about when I was building out this presentation. And it's kind of interesting when you look at like behavior incentives and like the normal, it's kind of weird because like most of the market considers like developer all be all, but as you're in these spaces with like engineering stuff, like there's actually a plethora of personas. But if you just look at the common thread today, like the incentives for like a developer and like a lot of these organizations that we're in, it's like they want to build features for the customer at the end of the day, right? And this is, I, I usually call this like feature development. And you know, they're highly focused, highly geared to the customer. But then what starts occurring, like to get to that chain with the customer, I, I call this like the, it's expiration of like all these ops. So there's, it started with DevOps, then you could call it like release ops, then, you know, tools engineering, but then you, there's sec ops and others, fin ops and SRE and operations, stuff like that. But in the common when we're doing this at like these bigger organizations like Apple and so forth, we, we consolidated around like platform engineering. And we did this for like the online store. And then what happened is like our platform engineering team, you know, basically suffice for all developers, but also these other teams that were with us, DevOps, for these engineering tools, we consolidate against one, but kind of like what we had to think about when we're building this tool chain, we had two customers. We had the developer and also the customer. So in this, when we started building out like these organizations like this, like why, why it streamlined a lot, like, you know, developers are only concentrating on customer. But when we think about like platform engineering and pieces like that, I'm concerned about like, how do customers going to interact with my site at scale and are they able to buy the phone and stuff like that? But also like for the developer, is the developer able to release this code on time or can we put this patch fix right now through all this, you know, different layers of, you know, teams and people that we're working through. So basically like when we were doing this at like platform engineering at Apple, like it was interesting to see like our perspective on this was just more than just the customer. It was always about everyone else and everything else. And the nice thing that like Luca wrote out, I think if he puts the blog up, <clears throat> it's basically like, it was kind of, it struck me and said like, it was the glue of the organization. You know, when you really think about it, you, you know, when you have a team, there's always like a couple members on the team that are like, 
are the glue of the team. And this is where it becomes interesting if like with the community spinning up and stuff like that, like I really think and believe, and you guys can comment and you know, you can say yes or nay on this, but like platform engineering is the glue of like a lot of these development organizations at scale. Cool. I think Matthias, I don't know if that's a good sign or bad sign, but I'll take either or so it's good. <laughs> cool guys. Um, in and I'll this, be like, dropping in in the chat, by the way, the the link to the to the article on the platform engineering or blog, just in case people want to refer back to that. But don't get distracted. Keep following the presentation. <laughs> no worries. Then I, I remind you, we're doing this like in like 2010 to 2016. Then you know I went to App Dynamics after that. But I always said anyone that's like circa 12, 2015 had like this golden age of like all these tools. Like I didn't, we didn't have this luxury back then, but like. The beauty of like what happened with like Apache and like CNCF, and I just took the CNCF landscape. You know, there's all this innovation and there's all these different tool chains you can pick or tools that you can combine up together to make, you know, build out your tool chain to deliver code to prod. But also with the innovation, there's huge complexity that we're starting to see. And like, you, you could imagine too from your side, like how do you work with all these things together? How do you optimize for this? Or how do you release this? Or how do you observe this? Like, there's so much stuff that you have to pick from. And like, so when I was working on this, like the second time I got recruited back to go to Apple, we were, we we're trying to figure out how to like optimize like the infrastructure, but also uh, let me go to the next slide. So you can kind of see, like, we're trying to figure out how to optimize with the infrastructure that we had that we were working with, but also in relation to like the developer and the customer. And then like any environment that you take today, you can see like there's all this other, and this is just a sample that we built, but there's all this other tooling that you did that you had to work with that, you know, either coming from where they started or where they're moving to, you had to kind of support to leverage all this infrastructure. So the one thing that we started seeing is like, how do we, I think the first iteration that we started is like, how do you make all this like flexible and reusable all at one time? You know, you know, you can do like infrastructure as code and stuff like that, and you know, as much as possible, but you run up to a point sometimes. Then the other thing that we started to see too is like if I wanted to understand like my developers flow through this, like and they're meeting the customer in the band, like I wanted to measure out specifically like KPIs and data around all this, all these different areas. Like, how long does it take me to fix this for a customer? How long does it take to release this? Then like you can throw in like all these other new things that are coming up, like FinOps. Like, how long does it take to manage this piece of infrastructure with this, with these number of people making these calls? So it was kind of interesting that we started like seeing all this like abstraction and new, new, new kinds of development methods. Like one time we're on Java, next we hired a bunch of new developers. That they're all using Python, Rust, Node. So what we started to notice and like what we wanted to build is like a full abstraction on top of all this stuff. One central point where a customer could then go to, and I mean our developer. And then they wouldn't have to worry about any of the tooling in the middle and any of the infrastructure. So the whole beauty that we were trying to do is like, could the developer in theory just work in one central spot to deliver features to the customer without ever worrying about what's in the back end or infrastructure? And there's some things that they have to worry about, but not to that detail. And can you release a feature on that screen? So like a lot of those things that we're asking ourselves a lot, we, we built this internally, like I think like three years back or two years back. But the interesting part is like when we started seeing like, it's interesting now, like there's all these new tools that are coming up like Luca mentioned, like Humanitech, Upbound, you know, Backstage came out with Spotify, that all these new tools are starting to do this. And the beauty of it, when what we saw is like, if you centralize some of the, these practices in one spot for platform engineering that they, these developers can work with, then it, it makes all this other stuff become really easy to use. Then the one KPI that we're always looking at is like, how are we meeting with the developers demand what they want and with the customer? So a, co a couple of things when I come through this and like just, I don't know if there's any questions that could, I can keep going from here. <clears throat> it's like, you can keep going. As we look at this and we, you know, we move forward to like the next pieces, like it's amazing to see, you know, first there's like, you know, DevOps con and like you take like, um, like SRE con and stuff like that. But now there's a central spot now for like this community getting built out, like for platform con. And like the beauty of it, like even the stories that I have, and you can ping me on LinkedIn or wherever after this is like, 
how like I, I want to know all the stories that everyone did and like how they how they approached the design or what technology you're using. And also a lot of this at the end of the day is like even though you have the best technology and stuff, it's like the culture that's in the in these teams that kind of resonate the most. Like you have to build this culture where people like what I what I used to think about earlier is like, oh, I need to control all these things. But like as I've been doing this for like a number of years already, like there's not you can't control really too much per se. You have to understand that, you know, there's always going to be a new observability tool. There's always going to be a new database. There's always going to be some new code. Like you have to accept that change and how do you adapt your environments into that change and accept it all the time? Like, you know, probably three years from now, Sneak will still be there, but there may be another tool better than Sneak. And then how are you going to take that into your environment? Then how do you roll that out everywhere? And those, those are the things that's beautiful about like this platform con and like this, platform engineering, you know, community from that aspect. Um, one thing that I, I, like the teams that I had, and I can tell you a story that we, we used to, there's this quote that we had when, before we sold like Agile Craft at Lasting. So we're in this office in this small little office in Texas. And like the one thing we, we saw this sign, like our, our CEO, Steve Elliott, used to put like a, all these like inspirational quotes around the office. And like, this one strikes me the best. I'm not gonna read it, you guys can read it, but it's basically synopsis is like, Every day you wake up, you have to run, whether you're this or this. So when, when, like, when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, it hits me. So like, the reason why it hit me is like, every time like my teams are managing my teams or we're doing anything, the only thing that we can do is like run the best that day and like do whatever we can. And then if we did that, we, you know, we get all these outcomes, these, these things coming out. And that's, and that's an essence that we're trying to do organizationally with the team and stuff. Like we're trying to build like, and I hope like platform and platform engineering and platform comms, like we're trying to build like these these things where we allow like all these engineers and you know feature developers to run as fast as possible. And then we can adapt and change in all those aspects. Um, I'm pretty much all through. I think Luca, did I go too fast? <laughs> no, I think that was great. Cool. Oh, wait, let me just pop up here and then we again there yeah all right no 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 this this is great um i, I love it and, and and i think again like the, the point of this today is just to keep it really conversational so that's just like a little bit of input for you guys um feel free to you know just jump into either the q a or the chat and and jump some questions there um in the meantime there was like something that you know you you quickly brought up on the uh developer experience lot um sort of like layer um that it's something that i see popping up in the community a ton um and it's basically how do you pick the right level of abstraction for developers right um and and it's something that we see as a, as a pretty tricky topic right because you have some developers that are extremely uh you know familiar and at this point like used to you know, do what we sometimes call shadow operations, but effectively, you know, they're really familiar with like the, the low level YAML files and whatever to deploy their stuff. Um, and if you introduce a layer between them and the, all the scripting that they need to do, they feel like they're abstracted away. At the same time, you also have, you know, developers that maybe are not super familiar with the, you know, IC Terraform plus Kubernetes setup on, you know, that, that they need to deploy to. Um, and maybe they don't want to be familiar with it. Um, and, and then they're, they're happy to sort of like be, you know, one or two steps above that and just use a CLI command or, you know, click around a UI. So how do you think about that? How have you thought about that? At your, you know, whenever building a platform, how do you pick the right level of abstraction for, for developers so that they're happy and you don't piss them off effectively? Yeah, I, I, that was interesting. It was like, like, you have to slow, you, you have to understand like the patterns first and slowly roll it out. Like when we did it first, like people were like used to just doing like, and this was, this was mainly around, I think, sorry, my son's in the, give me one second. Guys. I love it. The, the beauty, sorry, the beauty like, of live. <laughs> live in COVID world. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, like he has like this playroom that we, <laughs> that he has like all his toys over here. So he comes to my office, which is like my slash gym. So apologies. So like the, the right level abstraction. It was interesting because we had to figure out like 
there's this weird balance because you want to like please the customer and then also the developer, right? Then like the balance that we're trying to figure out is like, can I make this easier in a way? And this is where our thought pattern was. Can we make this easier way where the developers are just focused on the future? So we're rolling like, you know, cloud optimization is like the big thing we did because, you know, it grows 30% every. So does the developer really have to worry about like what instance they use and stuff like that? Then like, then do I expect the developer to really care about what instance they use or like, are they using bare metal or EC2 or Kubernetes? Like the, the point was like, if we extract, extracted all that, and what that was our theory, if you abstracted that away and they just went to the central spot to get like infrastructure or whatever, would that work? And what we know, some patterns we saw like on the positive side, you know, it would work. And then like, we would just present to them and we would always have to ask. Like at the end of the day, they're our customers. So we always have to ask, is this experience good or not? You know, then some are gonna say yes and some are gonna say no. But then you look at those trends and just keep moving. Like there's all these other cool tools now that are happening with like database abstractions and stuff like that. Kubernetes led to a lot of different abstractions. So the question becomes like, what does it really matter if you, if, if I gave you a place where you could go to centrally to make your features and you know build your apps and everything below that, whether it was Kubernetes, Docker, or like Mongo, Postgres, Cassandra, does, do those things ever matter anymore? Uh, and what, what we what we saw and when we came to the, the conclusion is, you know, at first it seems like the barrier, yes, that they would care, but after you saw like the features getting developed, you know, they didn't really care anymore. Then you just had to work with them and like as you build out any startup or any organization. You always have to take the customer feedback and hear the word at. I think that's the big thing in a lot of this. Like, like we're, we're lucky to be in the spot now where like anyone could build an app, like off of anything. You could start a startup like doing Webflow, some like low code, no code, and like start building it. But the the whole premise and all that at the end of the day is like, what does your customer want? And then and then platform engineering, like I like, and I hope you guys agree. Like, we have two customers. We have the customer customer, which is paying for some goods and you have your organization of developers and engineers that are then working with you. And that's like the balance that you always have to think about. Yeah, I love that. And 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 actually <clears throat> I think that's and by the way guys just dropping your questions like I you know I think like Lee and I can keep on like ranting about this stuff for for another half an hour but uh you know just jump in. Um but yeah to your point, I think like what's really interesting is like, how do you build this, um, you know, product mindset internally, right? Where, hey, your, your, your customers or your developers, right? And you as a platform team are building a, pl are building a product, right? And, and I think like that, that can be tricky sometimes, especially where um, there's not a clear um, sort of like evolution culturally from your, uh, um, you know, effectively like some sort of glorified sys admin team or, you know, some, some like operations, operations, um, uh, you know, SRE infrastructure, like however you want to call it, right? Like you're, you're not building a product. You're, you're really just like maintaining an infrastructure and all the different pieces. And that's great. But like to move from that to I'm building a product and I need to iterate on it uh, based on the feedback from my customer. And my customer is, my colleagues who are the application developers and product teams, that's like a very, very fundamental shift that needs to happen, right? So how do you, like, how do you, how do you ensure that, that that happens? Like, do you hire a new team? Do you like try to retrain people? Like, and, and, and how do you, how do you make sure that you can establish that feedback loop, right? Yeah, I think the, the like, uh, let me kind of, kind of unpack a little things in there. Like, what, when we had teams, like the one thing at the end of the day, like everyone wants to run a startup, whether you're at like Apple, Google, or you're running your own startup, then like, that's the thing these days. And like, if you look at most of the, like, I'm, I, I think I'm considered older for some other reason, but I still feel young. But if you look at the generation you're hiring to, like they all want that ability, right? So then how do you build a culture and where they could like experience a startup within like an Apple, Google, or Netflix, or, you know, like the ones that are coming out today, if you take like Upbound, Humanitech, and those ones, like, how do you build that culture? And the thing is like, the, the one thing that we always did, because we, we wanted like to recruit anyone, you know, no matter what they were. And I, I kind of learned this from like, um, when I was working with ThoughtWorks, it's like, they do this fantastic thing where like, 
you could be like an engineer or you could be like a history major. But after like six months of like the, the delivery of what they put you through, you're an engineer. And then then like the team culture itself, like, like it was always a joke because when, when I used to hire me, you could never hire one thought, you have to hire a team of them, like at least five to like build out the proper tool. Then the beauty of it, like after an essence is like the team concept. Then if you understand the team concept, then like, how do you motivate these teams of people to do? You know, you can do the normal approach where it's like, hey, we're going to support these amount of tickets or copy these pipelines over and over again for this new service. But if you started like having the teams look at a different goal, like how do you build up, like let's build this as a product. Then what product, how, how would you interact internally with the product? Would you build like a website or would, how, it's like, it would be normal, like the whole thing coming out with PLG today. Like, could you do that internally within your organization? And, you know, you're going to work on some level of abstraction. You're going to do some of these pieces. And then have like basically telemetry or anything to figure out like how are the customer flows in it? How do you convert these customers? So even though we're at like Apple or for startup, like when we're in these massive companies, the one thing is like, I always tell my team, like, you know, there's a, it's like marriage. There's, there's probably like a 60% probability that you'll, you'll leave this group within one to two years. <laughs> like, I feel bad because the marriage numbers are like that too. So it's kind of interesting. But, <laughs> But I, I used to tell them like, hey, when they first joined the team or whoever joined the team, yeah, you'll, you'll leave in two years, but it's fine. But the, the one thing you'll learn here, I'm not gonna teach you how to be like the best engineer or whatever, but I'll teach you how to build a product. And I know we're doing like FinOps or whatever this, but let's build this product. And then if we built this product, you leave in two years, it'd be good. Maybe you learned enough, then you can start your own startup. And we see that, and luckily I experienced that and I see that happening with some of the guys today. But that's the thing, like, can you treat everything that you do within your organization, like on products and running it that way. Oh, we have a question from Nathan. Um, some teams push back against the idea of development portals with concerns around not wanting limitations or being told what to do. Do you have a answer to that? Um, let me see, sorry, I lost the chat. Do, do you have any common messaging to handle that situation? You call that right after. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, like it's, it's like a lot of these things when I see this in the development portal and like how it's rolling out, like at first it would be like my analogy to this would be no different than when I was in 2010 trying to do like a CI CD pipeline for everyone to do. So it, it takes time for developers just to trust it because a lot of times I work with a, a lot of engineers, you know, be all like, you know, they're, they're geniuses and they're smart, but there's a lot of things, there's no one that's perfect. So like there has to be something at a barrier that you're gonna attempt to agree with to then experiment to see if it's better. Then if it's not better to move on. But like uh, in, my, in my things with the development portal, like as you're rolling out any new tooling and stuff like that, you're gonna have to meet each other eye to eye and like figure out like, do we wanna do this? Let's experiment. And if you have that opportunity with your organization to at least experiment and try, then you're good. Uh, the limitations on like being told what to do and stuff like that, like, it's not, I think those are more just barriers of entry per se, just because that's what it is. But like, if you look at like the intrinsic value and like the incentives of it, like the developer's only concern mostly around is like, how do I build features fast for the customer? You know, the person buying the thing. Then if that stays, what my belief is, if that stays at par, then I don't know what the concern of the rest of it would be. Yeah. Minus if like what you're hosting has a bunch of outages and stuff like that. But if if you're doing that together, I don't, I don't see why. So it's more like personality of what I see a lot of times. In your experience, how do you define ownership access of a system provider or between development teams and platform engineer teams? This one is interesting, George. So <laughs> when, again, this is like behavioral. So. Maybe, maybe let's just read out because um, you know, George just sent it to, to the two of us uh, so that the others can, can see it. But so George is asking, in your experience, how did you define ownership and access of a system provider or other between development teams and platform engineer? Yeah, so in this one, we're, we're like, I'm not gonna say, I'll, I'll say the names of someone else. So when, I, we're, when we're doing this for an online store, um, I had a great guy, his name was uh, Michael. And he was like, I was basically, I was basically like overall in charge of like all the infrastructure, managing that with Michael. And Michael was basically the platform director. Then we had another one named Sam. 
and Sam led the whole development team. The one thing that we saw in that, like not, there wasn't really ownership per se, it was like, it was shared ownership. Because like, if those two leaders don't agree with each other on how to run this organizationally, you don't get the support. Like, like Michael can't roll anything out that Sam doesn't want to use. So like, we tried to roll out like a, like Hazelcast for a caching layer. Michael's not going to implement that with his teams if he doesn't see the data on how this is better and stuff from that standpoint. So we had to make sure like the alignment between me, Michael, and Sam was all perfect from that degree. And then the thing is like, it's a, a lot of this is like people that like showing the data to trust. So once we got that agreement, the things that we did after that was like amazing. Like, like I wish I could tell you like what, like some of the things we did, like, like if we took, like what was that? It was like 2011 to 2016. So I don't know if you guys can ever find it. There's an incident on the news where the Apple, the Apple store can take orders. So like, I don't know if you guys know like transactions per second. So like, I'll just tell you some skewed numbers because I can't really give it out. But like Target at that point in time and like Amazon, this is like 2011, like Black Friday, they couldn't really do like 20 to 40 orders per second. You know, we're doing like five times as much as that. But we still couldn't handle all these orders because you're taking global traffic. But between those years to like 2015, 2016, like because me, Sam, and Michael were highly united and like aligned on what we wanted to do, then what it allowed us to do is like scale the store out to like a gazillion orders per second. Like I could take on the whole world, you could throw a rock at it. That store, that incident will never occur again. So I don't know if you guys find a news article on it, but. It was like kind of like the worst days of like our lives. <laughs> like we couldn't take on someone. It's like the store stopped. Everyone's calling. Can't take any orders on the on the website. You're like, I can't buy my iPad. It's like nuts. So, any other questions? Do you have any comments? Yeah, there's a there's one in Q and A uh, from Bill. So he's asking, you started developing Portal from nothing. What is the first thing that you would add there? It's a good question. Oh, sorry, Luca, can you repeat that again? Yeah, so you start a developer portal or IDP from nothing. What is the first thing that you would add there? Um, like what we did, and I can tell them, like we did infrastructure first, like just AWS, GCP, and then whatever. Then we, we started offering like, instead of like people interacting with the, like the AWS console or like the GCP console, I don't know what it's called, but we started with that. And then started offering like the different services within the organization. Like if someone had a one in Mongo, Redis and stuff like that, then because you, you do those bare things first to understand where everyone's using and what everyone's using. Then, then if you have enough telemetry, you can figure out like, hey, this is made for like this type of application, this type of application. So like I used it more as a data point to figure out like, what's everything getting attached to? Then you could start like abstracting different services. So if you wanted to, you could say, hey, let's just build like a mess, like a queuing service. Then one day you may use like, I don't know, Kafka or tomorrow you may use like Hive, MQ or stuff like that. So those are things like, once you start understanding those patterns then you can like hot swap things in the future. And the thing is like, what, what we wanted at that scale, like you could imagine like every customer is trying to sell to us. And they keep ratcheting their number every year after year. So I wanted like full abstraction and control on like pricing leverage on like all these providers. Like it could be a Splunk, Cap Dynamics, or whatever. And I wanted the ability to control like if if my development community supported me, and then the tools that we rolled out were, you know, they were supportive of that and we got the feedback from them. I wanted, I wanted the ability, my team wanted the ability to say, hey, this is like if sneak may be hot right now. But in five years from now, there may be a different sleep that I wanted the ability to move to that if I wanted to. Or like my like a lot of times when you pick these tools out there, like even in the seeds up, like imagine if you had the ability just to hot swap things over and over again, like containers to Kubernetes or Kubernetes to like whatever it's going to be next and stuff like that. Because every three to five years, like with all the innovation happening, things are changing so fast. Then the thing is like, do you, like sometimes you can't just stay with Java for like the next 20 years. You know, it may work. I'm not saying like hammer, you know, people have been using a hammer the same way for X amount of years, but there's better ways to do that. You know what I mean? Like, can you have the flexibility with your organization with the environment changing to allow some of those changes in it? 
And that's like, and that's why when I thought like when we built this internal development portal internally ourselves, we started with that to understand like the metrics and pieces like that. But it was in essence to give us that ability for like the long haul, like how then you do this and then how then you manage this. Yeah, 100%. I find like, <clears throat> you know, one thing that always comes up in the community is kind of like, you know, everyone will have their different uh, sort of like decision point and choices about tech stack and what tools they use and tool chain so on. But everyone at the end of the day struggles with the same, you know, how do you make this framework flexible enough to adapt across multiple, you know, across different generation of tools. And another thing that people are always kind of like asking about in the community is also like, how do you, you know, irrespective of what tool stack you go for, how do you uh, make sure that you get internal, enough internal support, especially on the executive level to roll the stuff out? And I imagine like, especially stuff like Apple, like how did you, how did you do that? And then George, we'll get, we'll get to your question as well. But how did you, how did you guys think about, you know, internal marketing for this stuff, basically? Yeah, like we had to do internal marketing. So like, like basically we have like these sessions called like brown bags and stuff like that, that it'd be no different. Like if you're like, we, we treated like a product, like if we wanted conversion on like a tool, like conversion pipeline for sales, you would, you would target those customers that are going to be, it's like the, I think, in startup world, it's like to get to like series C, you first get your 10 customers at C, then your next 10 paying this amount, then your next 10 paying this, and you get to like series A, B, and C, you know what I mean? So like the same thing that, if you take apply that same methodology inside, you would have to do the same thing. You have to figure out what customers are gonna use you to give you feedback. You're gonna balance between the customers that like it and the customers that don't. So the customers that like it may not give you good feedback, but the customers that don't will give you the brutal feedback, then you go from there. Then that's where we kept moving to from that standpoint. Then it's at the end of the day, like if you treat it like a product and building a product internally, then you take some of like the startup behavior that you see today. It's kind of interesting when you apply that inside, like how would it work? Then like, because you need like a lot of it, again, you need like telemetry and like data to understand like how, how, how the user behaviors are on this. And that's what we use. We use like a lot of like reducing the feedback loops to give us back like what we wanted and understand like what data points to move. Then like from our customer's point of view, you know, we would always ask them like, hey, we're gonna go from this to this, do you, do you mind? So <clears throat> you wrap everything in. Sorry, you wanna read George's question, Luca, then I can answer it. Sure, so George is asking, um, so you really wrapped around everything then. So say if a developer team needed a queue, they would use an internal queue product that is available via an API or SDK without knowing what support that wrapper under the root, under the hood. So what's supporting that wrapper under the hood, yeah. Yeah, so we had this incident and I can tell you, we moved from like, um, we moved from Rabbit to Solus and we abstracted and we just had an API that we were offering it to. So like initially how we rolled it out, um, because we didn't do an internal development portal back then. Like we just did basically everything as APIs back then, but like this is 2013. So we did the same thing. Like we just had an API in our SDK that they would integrate it to. Then we would tell, like we would start shifting traffic if we saw, because like, again, we had Sam as our support. So Sam would say, okay, this pattern looks good. Now let's light it up for the next like 30 developers using this and start migrating. The one thing when you start doing it this way, this abstraction, it becomes interesting because like, like I don't know if you guys ever like, if you guys ever tried to roll out a new technology to replace a technology within your organization. It's like pulling out teeth, okay? Like even if you went from like new relic to app dynamics, it's like pulling teeth or like app dynamics to like data dump. So it's interesting when you start looking if you had this abstraction like this, or even like if you do queuing, like the essence of why they're using the queues and understanding like if you build all the migration utilities and stuff like that to go from like, we went from Rabbit to Solus, like you would, you have to build the utilities for the customers to move over. Once they start moving over, you can't just go 100%. So you have to curb every behavior. But then the thing that we did is we had an API and SDK that they would integrate to. And like, they didn't know at the, at the end of the day, they still, it's kind of funny because some people knew that they were using Solus 
And some people don't even know that they're using, that they just migrated off a rabbit. So it's kind of interesting when you see that behavior happen. Sorry. Um, from Bill, do you establish some sort of SLAs with the team, internal teams to consume your product? Yeah, like, again, like we could follow like the normal, like I call them like KPIs, but like you, we, we always have the normal like SLA, SLI, SLO and stuff like that, that behavior. What are my KPIs to understand like how, how they're migrating on, what they're consuming, how well they're consuming it, how well we're supporting it overall, just to present to them like that piece. And those like the one thing, like if you see a lot of, like if you just offer like, we were offering like infrastructure. So if you offer like compute, you can see the behavior where like, okay, they're all going to like EKS versus GKE. Then like, then the question is like, do we want them to, you know, stay in that route or do we want like another abstraction on it? So those are things that we would kind of figure out what our development could be. But you need to, that, that's what I mean, like with data and KPIs, you could call them, I think everyone calls them like SLOs, SLIs and stuff like that. You, you need to understand like how the user behavior and patterns with data to your customers to understand what to do and then to do next. I think if the essence of like what we get out of this, it's you have to measure everything. Like we, just, we always used to joke around, like people say, oh, why do we have to measure like the service and stuff like that? I like, were you a runner in high school? If you're a runner, there's a guy with a stopwatch every day tracking how fast you're going, if you're getting better or worse. So that's what we want to know. We want to know if we're going north or south or regressing or progressing. Like you have to measure to understand that. Sorry. Sweet. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a couple of people that join late. So no worries. This at the beginning, we'll send everything out tomorrow. Um, you get everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I also want to be mindful of time. We only have like a couple of minutes left. So if anyone, any more questions, we can we can give you one, two more minutes. Alan, I'm looking at you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> we can make you present if you want to jump in and just like uh <laughs> um I mean I I <clears throat> I have um uh ooh, what's this? Oh, like if you don't have any today, tell us the last story that we were doing. Please, please do, please do. Okay, so this was an interesting picture that we saw. Like, um, like my friend Barry O'Reilly, he does like these things for like he rolled out a new book. Um, he did Lean Enterprise with Jez Humble, like ex dot worker. Then he did this thing like this was like his book publishing for Unlearn. So we're in this big Google conference about, about it's like I think it's their incubator lab down in Howard in San Francisco. So like the sign shows up, like things, we have to continue to be jumping off cliffs, cliffs and developing our wings on the way down. So like, it's like, it struck me because like, when I was looking at this, it's like, oh, okay. So like nothing, because I, I was in the notion, I think a lot of times like, well, I want fixed everything. I want to control everything. But like, this tells me that you just have to be able to change everything every time and like accept that. You know, I used to manage my teams like, hey, we have to remove enough variability in the team. So everything that we can't is fixed. But no matter what, there's still gonna be some variability. <laughs> so even in that, like if you look at like all the innovation and all the variability that's happening, like for me, once, once I became comfortable with accepting that and moving from that, it made a lot of like my mindset of how I then handle these things and then how I look at like these patterns or like platform engineering and stuff like that. It was like, like, I just have to accept that things are going to change, and like, how do I, how do I rapidly adopt or manage this throughout my organization? And that, I think that's the big thing. And you know, like one thing, like I said before, is like, again, you have to do this with a lot of like data, and understanding like your customer behavior, both your end customer, and also like your development customers and your engineering base. Sorry, I think there's one more chat. There is Nathan. I, this is a great question. So. Nathan is asking, when onboarding your initial customers, would you advise either to tackle the full vertical or just one or two teams uh, <clears> or <throat> solving something smaller but essential for many teams? So this is one thing I learned when I was, like I, I worked with ThoughtWorks on numerous engagements because the, the one thing I liked about them was like this team concept and then like, you do things really small and then um, you, you go off to big teams. But Nathan, like my my, my recommendation is you start really small. Then you understand like what you want to test, what pattern you want to see. Maybe with one, two customers. 
then those one, two customers, then you start like, it's like a snowball coming off a cliff. It'll get bigger as it goes down, but you have to understand, like, I think the big thing is like, you have to get that feedback loop. So understandable whenever you, with the one to two people, then if you scale off to 10, it has to be the same thing. You just keep doing it. Then over time, just because of like the behavior and the support, even the detractors in the beginning with, with that mess, they'll come on board. It's just, it's just like human behavior. Have I seen it over and over again? So my recommendation start small, then, you know, build it up and get more support from there. That's the best way to do it. Like, Atlassian didn't become Atlassian overnight. <laughs> you have to remember a lot of these things, you know, they started really small, developed the community, built out support. Then the community becomes infectious throughout your whole organization. I think that's the big thing. That's why like what Luca does with like platform con and platform engineering, I like, you know, I, I applaud him every time on that. Love that. Let's end on that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but yeah, I, I think we're in time. So <clears throat> you have the last five seconds, guys, to drop any questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Just, you know, still to the end. In fact, the numbers just went up uh, till now. So it's awesome. Um, and, and, and let us know. Um, oh, by the way, let me, let me just drop in the usual. Um, just, uh, just one more link, just in case you guys are not in here. Um, there's the, you know, the platform engineering Slack channel. Thanks, Alan. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Great questions as well. Um, if you're not in there, uh, you know, both Lee and I are, are in the Slack channel. Um, you can just follow up there with any questions you have. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> also let us know like how the, the, the format was like, I really enjoyed it. Keeping more conversational versus just going through a bunch of slides and then opening up for Q and A. So I really enjoy doing this. Um, let us know what you guys think in the in the Slack. Um, again, don't worry about it. We'll follow up tomorrow with everything. Lee, thank you so much, man. So it was No great. problem, hey guys, I'm on the Slack channel, so just hit me up, okay? Take care, guys. Awesome. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Ciao, ciao.